In this review video, we're going to discuss cancer in two different considerations. We'll talk about the genetics of cancer, and then we'll also talk about uh, different cancer treatments and why they now make sense given the context that we've learned about cancer uh, and how physicians and clinicians make the decision as to how to treat different tumor forms and why those treatments make uh, logical and clinical sense. But first, the genetics of cancer. Uh, so in previous videos, we've touched on this idea of two different classes of genes that can result in cancer progression. And they are tumor suppressor genes and oncogenes. And of course, being genes, each of these classes encode proteins. So we can have tumor suppressor proteins and oncoproteins. Both of these types or classes of genes have the potential to contribute to cancer. Now, it's very rare that any one mutation causes cancer. We've made the point many, many times in other review videos as well as the main lecture that cancer is a disease of accumulated mutations. But so, taken through that lens, then mutations to tumor suppressor genes or mutations to oncogenes can further contribute to cancer until ultimately perhaps you have so many accumulated mutations that you have the, set, the stage set for uh, cancer to develop, to manifest. But here we're going to focus on the genetics of cancer and why uh, in the punchline you'll see that tumor suppressor genes tend to be recessive for cancer and oncogenes tend to be dominant for cancer. First, let's define what these two different gene categories do, what the proteins they encode are for. So in general, tumor suppressor genes encode proteins that are protective. These are proteins that we want to have expressed. These are proteins that keep us protected from cancer. We've already talked at some length about one of these proteins. It's P53. P53 causes the cell cycle to, st to stall in G1 when there are a bunch of induced mutations. And this stall allows the cell to either repair those mutations or default to apoptosis. That's a good thing. If we don't have P53 then the cell will not stall in the cell cycle. Those induced mutations will not be repaired and they will begin to accumulate over time. So we want P53. It protects us from cancer. It protects us from additional mutations. We want tumor suppressor genes in general to be active because they are protective as well. When it comes to oncogenes, oncogenes promote cancer. When these genes express their oncoproteins, those proteins cause cancer to be more likely. So this is a head scratcher. You might say to yourself, well, why in the world would we even have genes in our genome that cause cancer in the first place? It's not that they cause cancer. It's that they encode properties and phenotypes and characteristics that tend to be cancerous in nature. So some examples of this, a little bit more general, is proliferative. I think I spelled that right, proliferative, uh, motility, no adhesion. So if we have a highly proliferative cell that is modal and lacks adhesion to neighboring cells, what do we have? We have a metastatic cell. This is a cell that is dividing uncontrollably. It's not bound to the cells around it, so it's free to invade neighboring tissues. And it's motile, so it can crawl along the ECM and make its way to the bloodstream and spread to other parts of the organism, other parts of the patient or the individual. But each of these individual characteristics needs to be encoded in our genome because we all had to go from a single cell to approximately an eight pound baby in 37 weeks. That means we need information in our genome that encodes for massive proliferation. We need genes that encode proteins to cause our cells to divide nearly uncontrollably for embryogenesis. We need certain cells to be modal because we want cells to be patrolling our bodies, immune system cells most notably. We want them in the bloodstream. We want them out of the bloodstream. We want them to be able to crawl to a wound or infection site to fight infection, and that's, that's normal. And we don't want all cells to be adhesive. If all cells were entirely adhesive to their surrounding extracellular matrices, then axons would never be able to pathfind to their target neurons to create the central nervous system. So we have proteins in our genome that allow for proliferation, that allow for motility, that allow for no adhesion, but we don't want these genes being expressed inappropriately and more especially, we don't want these genes being expressed together in a single cell because that's going to create a lot of problems. But these are 
our oncogenes, these genes that encode proteins for proliferation, for motility, for a lack of adhesion, these are oncogenes because when expressed, these genes can lead to cancer-like traits in a cell. And if you get enough of these expressed together, then you can certainly have a cell that is cancerous, if not also metastatic. So again, we have our protective genes, our tumor suppressor genes that keep us from accumulating mutations. And then we have our oncogenes that encode cellular phenotypes that could accumulate to cause a cancerous cell to develop. Now, when it comes to our tumor suppressor genes, we want these expressed. We want these genes on because their proteins are protective. So given the choice, would you like your tumor suppressor genes on and active? Would you like them off and repressed? We want them on. Those proteins keep us safe. Those proteins keep us protected from cancer. Conversely, except for the very rare exception in the very unique cell types where these, uh, these properties are needed, we want oncogenes off. We want them repressed because we don't want a skin cell to be modal or non-adhesive. We don't want a liver cell to be highly proliferative, except in these very rare circumstances, we want the oncogenes off. That's what we want. So them's the ground rules, as we say. Now let's talk about the genetics. So the Mendelian definition of genetics, to refresh your memory from a previous course that you may have taken with me, a pre the, the definition of Mendelian genetics is that dominance is defined as the state at which you only need one allele to show the trait. So if this is brown eyes and this is blue eyes, and we have one brown allele and one blue allele, and the organism shows the brown trait, that means brown is dominant. So the dominant trait is the trait that you need only one allele to show. Uh, even if you're a heterozygote, you show the dominant trait. The recessive trait in Mendel's definition is the trait that you need two identical alleles to show. That's the only way you can show a recessive trait. So if this is blue eyes and this is blue eyes, the only way that you're going to have blue eyes is by having two identical alleles. So the other way of saying that is the recessive trait is the trait that you do not see in the heterozygotic condition. The dominant trait is the phenotype. The recessive trait is hidden or not the phenotype. Now, in this case, the trait that we are considering is having cancer. That's the phenotypic trait that we are considering, uh, having cancer. If we look at tumor suppressor genes, we're all born, if we're born healthy, we're all born with two alleles, one from mom and one from dad. And those two alleles should be both on for our tumor suppressor genes because that's the default healthy state. So we should have a functional working P53 gene from our mother, and we should have a functional working P53 gene from our father. And both of those genes should be on for us to be healthy. If we have a mutation in one of those alleles, and now that allele is off instead of being on, what's going to happen? Well, we'll still make the tumor suppressor protein from the on allele, and we won't make any protein from the off allele. But the real question becomes, does the cell have a tumor suppressor protein? Yes, it does. And if we have the protective nature of P53 being made, if we have that protein in our genome, will we develop cancer? And the answer is no, we won't develop cancer. We still have the protection. That means the trait cancer is recessive. And what is dominant is the working tumor suppressor gene. So for tumor suppressor genes, mutations in those genes are recessive because we continue to be protected by the dominant working allele that continues to make the protective protein. So cancer is recessive for tumor suppressor genes. Let's now go to, oops, I didn't want to do that. Let's now go to and make the same consideration for oncogenes. Now in oncogenes, if we are healthy and born with two functional alleles, those two alleles that we get from mom and dad should both be off because that's what we want. That's what healthy cells have. They have genes that are off. 
Now, if one of these alleles picks up a mutation, and that mutation causes the oncogene to be on, now we have expression, and this oncoprotein will be synthesized in the cell. In this case, we're making the protein that further contributes to cancer, and we only needed one mutant allele to do that. So in this scenario, that one mutant allele is the dominant allele, and the healthy allele we were born with is the recessive allele because its non-cancerous phenotype is now hidden, and this cell is more prone to cancer. So in the example of tumor suppressor genes, healthy was dominant and cancer was recessive because this protein that we were still making was protective. In the oncogene story, healthy is recessive, cancer is dominant because the dominant allele is the allele that makes the protein that causes cancer. So that's the genetics of cancer. Let's take that one step further now and talk about predispositions of cancer and how cancer itself can't be an inherited disease, but predispositions for cancer can be inherited. So if we go to the oncogene story first and foremost, if mom gives a healthy working and repressed oncogene to the child, and dad gives a mutant oncogene, which is active and expressing the oncoprotein, that embryo will have cancerous tendencies. That embryo, before it even breathes its first breath, is going to have aberrant cellular behavior. And most often, I, I mean extraordinarily often, that embryo will not be viable and it will spontaneously abort as a miscarriage. So that's why cancer can't be inherited as a disease because the oncogenes are dominant. And if they're making their oncogenic proteins in the embryo, the embryo is not likely to be uh, viable. So in the heterozygotic condition, oncogenes tend to be fatal for embryos. Now let's consider that mom is giving the, uh, excuse me. Now let's consider that mom is giving the functional, healthy, protective, dominant tumor suppressor gene. And dad is giving the cancer causing allele here this child is born healthy because they're making the protective protein from this wild type allele that they got from their mother. But I'd like you to contrast that individual to another healthy individual who got a working functional expressed allele from their mother and their father. Let's imagine both of these individuals smoke some cigarettes. Let's imagine both of them sit out in the sun. Both of them live under high-tension power lines. Both of them are near a Superfund site with a contaminated water supply. And both of them are hit with environmental mutations that are uh, cancer-causing. Individual num number one gets one of those mutations. And individual number two gets the same exact mutation. What do you notice now? Now you notice that the first individual who was born healthy but got a non-functional tumor suppressor gene from their father, that individual is now going to accumulate mutations and very likely develop cancer. Individual number two still has the working allele that still makes protective protein, and this individual will remain healthy at least for the time being. So although these two individuals were born healthy, the individual on the left was predisposed for cancer because they were essentially only operating on a single functional tumor suppressor gene. The individual on the right, although we couldn't see it phenotypically, was more healthy because they had a two allele system that allowed them to absorb some buffering of environmental mutations if one of those alleles should happen to be mutated. So this idea of predisposition really comes down to the recessive quality of tumor suppressor genes. Some people are born with a mutant tumor suppressor allele, and they are more likely to develop cancer later on in life if that functional wild-type allele should become mutated. Individuals who are homozygotic dominant have two working tumor suppressor alleles. They have that much more absorption power of encountering mutations from the environment and being able to tolerate them genetically. So we will close then with this idea of different types of tumors and the different treatments that are often used to combat them. Now the first tumor type isn't even cancer. 
This is benign tumors, um, not considered malignant, not considered cancerous, but dangerous all the same. Malignant is just another word for invasive. These are cancerous tumors now, uh, and they are invasive, and we're all familiar with the term metastatic. This is a cancer that spreads. So everything to the right of the red line is cancer, and benign is not cancerous. So in a benign tumor, cells are proliferating rapidly. That's why we have a tumor. So there is proliferation of the cells. That's our first kind of um, hallmark feature of any tumor. But these cells are not modal, so they cannot crawl around, and they remain adhesive. So their desmosomes, their adherence junctions, their tight junctions are all intact. So in this case, this benign tumor is benign. It's non-cancerous because it's not invasive. And the reason it's not invasive is because every single cell of the tumor is tightly stuck to the tumor and tightly bound to the neighboring cells that are adjacent to it. That means that as a tumor, clinically, this tumor has very defined margins. A surgeon can see very clearly where the tumor ends and where healthy tissue begins. And that surgeon can then remove this benign tumor surgically and have the utmost of confidence that the entire tumor was removed. So surge, surgical, I don't know if I spelled that right. I actually know I didn't, but I'm not going to figure out why. Um, so surgery is the most common option for benign tumors because there's really no risk. Get the rapidly dividing cells out of there so they, do, they don't cause any harm. And um, you'll know that you got the entire tumor out because the cells are so tightly stuck to one another. For a malignant tumor, in a malignant tumor, you have a main tumor, but these cells are not only proliferative, they are also non-adhesive. They've lost the ability to bind tightly to the cells around them. However, these cells are still not modal. So here, cancerous cells spread, and it is considered invasive, but they spread only to neighboring tissues because these cells can't really crawl. They're just invading because they're not tightly bound to their neighboring cells. As you can see here, the margins are not clearly defined because even if the surgeon removes the primary tumor as far as he or she can see it, there are still all of these cells that have been left behind because they weren't part of the main tumor. They had broken off of the main tumor and kind of cohabitated with healthy cells around them. For this reason, commonly, we still have a surgical option surgical. I'll spell it differently even though that's not right either. But we also often couple this with radiation. And the idea is that you remove the mass of the tumor with the surgical option, but you know as the clinician that you could not have gotten every cell. Cells have broken off of the tumor because the tumor was malignant. So you're going to hit that tissue with radiation to try to kill the remaining cancerous cells that you weren't able to get with the surgery. Now, some people opt for radiation alone if they don't want to deal with the side effects of surgery. That's, of course, a clinical decision between a patient and their doctor. But surgery and radiation tend to be the most common choice treatments for malignant tumors. Now in metastatic tumors, here I'm going to try to draw an actual individual, but you're all aware of my horrible drawing skills. In a metastatic tumor, we have a primary tumor site. There is rapid proliferation. There is no adhesion, but now there is also motility. So these cells can crawl, and they crawl and they move actively and modally away from the non-adhesive tumor because they are a malignant tumor, and they get into the bloodstream and they can get into a secondary site. And in that secondary site, they can grow a secondary tumor in the brain, in the lung, in the bone. And here we have cancer spreading throughout the entire patient's body. Again, that cancer is rapidly dividing it is not adhesive, so it is invasive, but it's that motility that allows these cells to crawl to the bloodstream and make their way to new organ systems. This is the most dangerous cancer. 
There are some interesting facets that we don't have time to discuss in metastatic cancers, such as the primary tumor actually secretes inhibitory molecules that stops the secondary tumors from growing. That's because the primary tumor doesn't want the competition for, net, for uh, resources and nutrients that other growing secondary tumors would cause. And that's why sometimes when the primary tumor is removed surgically, patients quickly succumb to secondary tumor growth because now with those molecules released, um, we see those secondary tumors start to grow. So we've moved further and further away from a surgical option for uh, metastatic tumors because of this. And instead, what we default to here is chemotherapy. Now, chemotherapy is a systemic treatment. That's where usually intravenously, we flood the patient with the cancer-fighting drug and that's because we know that there are cancer cells dispersed all across the patient systemically. So the only way to treat metastatic cancer is to douse the patient entirely in the cancer-causing drugs. Now, what do those drugs block? Well, they block motility because that's part of the problem, but they mostly block proliferation. And so rapidly dividing modal cells are killed off by chemotherapy. That sounds great because that's the cancer cells being killed off by chemotherapy. But other modal cells are immune system cells. That's why a lot of people who are on chemotherapy get ill very easily because they're very, very susceptible to contagions because their immune system is so knocked down by this anti-motility medication they're taking. And then we also see as major side effects of chemotherapy, loss of hair, skin lesions, and easy wounding, uh, lots of gastrointestinal di distress, well, why do we see that? Because the most proliferative healthy cells are our skin lining cells, our follicle cells, our epithelial cells of the gut lining, and those cells are being killed by the chemotherapy as well. So chemotherapy kills rapidly dividing cells. Many of those are the cancer cells, that's great, but some of those are healthy cells that we kind of wanted to be rapidly dividing, but they no longer can in the presence of the drug, and that can have some pretty harsh side effects. So. Uh, wrapping up here, uh, we really want to have an appreciation for the three different tumor types, benign being not cancerous, but still potentially dangerous because you have a rapidly dividing tumor in you, but it's easy to remove surgically as long as it's not near any critical tissues uh, because its margins are so well defined and the cells are just so adherent to one another. Malignant cells still localize in a single location, but they're invasive in the sense that those cells are breaking off of the primary tumor and becoming embedded in healthy tissue nearby. It's virtually impossible for even the most skilled surgeon to remove the entire tumor. Cells are left behind, so we usually couple surgery with radiation. And finally, metastatic tumors where the cancer has spread throughout the body, and then we need a systemic treatment to fight all rapidly dividing cells, and unfortunately that can have some pretty harsh treatments. So hopefully that clarifies the genetics of cancer as well as our clinical approaches to cancer. And that wraps up the review videos for cell and molecular biology for this crazy semester, uh, spring of 2020, in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. Be well, everybody.